There is a principle in cryptography that we rely upon and it's called Kirchhoff's principle. Uh, this principle says that cipher must not be required to be secret and it must be able to fall into the hands of the enemy without inconvenience. In other words, the, secur the security of the system must rest entirely on the secrecy of the key. So you don't have to keep the algorithm secret. Uh, it is enough for you to keep the key secret. So uh, some people still uh, assume that they can obtain security by uh, hiding the algorithm or designing a cipher so that it doesn't use a key but the design is so complicated that it is assumed that the attacker would never guess but this is called security by obscurity and we have uh, tons of examples where this assumption failed in a miserably so you should always uh, assume that the algorithm, the cipher, can fall into the hands of the enemy. This principle is also uh, used by Shannon, but he used a different, he used different words, saying the enemy knows the system, and this is actually realistic because we call the following three B's of cryptography: bribe, burglary, and blackmail. Because of these B's. Uh, it is always uh, plausible to assume that the algorithm that you are trying to keep secret can fall into the hands of the enemy. So uh, this principle is important and the rest of the course and all our academic work actually is based are based on this. Okay, so let's move on to the Vernum cipher, in other words, one time path. So most of the people always ask when they heard cryptography, they wonder if we can design a cipher that is unbreakable. And the short answer is yes, we can do it. And one time pad is actually unbreakable. So idea is as follows. Generate a very long sequence of random bits. So assume that we are working on zeros and ones in this uh, example, but we can also use one time pad for uh, letters too. But assume that we somehow uh, mapped every letter to some bits, so they are zeros and ones. So encryption is, works as follows. You write your plain text again in, in zeros and ones, and you XOR the plain text with the one time pad to get the cipher text. And the person who wants to decrypt, <coughs> the person who wants to decrypt the cipher text XORs the one time pad with the cipher text and guess the plain text. So ID is as follows. You write your plain text in zeros and ones. This is an example. And you write your one time pad here and you perform XOR operation. XOR means exclusive OR operation. And it is actually an addition in modulo two. So it works like a normal addition. For instance, zero, if you add zero to one, you get one. Or if you add one to zero, you get one. And for 0 plus 0, you get 0. But 1 XOR 1 is 0, like you are adding in uh, modulo 2, but there's no carry bits. So in this example, or in this representation, every column actually affects the same column. It doesn't affect anything on its right or left. So once you have the ciphertext, the person who wants to decrypt the message has also the one time pad. So if you XOR both of this, for instance, one XOR one is zero, one XOR zero is one and so on. So you get the plain text. So it is just a simple XOR operation. But uh, in order to use the system, one time pad must be truly random. So it has to be generated in a random way. So if there are some statistical weaknesses or if it is not random, then the attacker might guess this information and uh, capture the one time pad or decrypt the cipher text and so on. And another important thing is that you can use a one time pad only once. If you encrypt a plain text with this one time pad and obtain the cipher text and later if you get another plain text but use the same one time pad and get the second cipher text and send this to the person you are communicating, the attacker who captured the first and the second cipher text uh, if they assume that you use the same one time pad, can capture the some part of the plain text or sometimes the whole plain text. So 
runtime path provides perfect secrecy. This is, means that ciphertext provides no information about plain text. And uh, since this one time, the key you are using in this case is one time pad actually, and usually it is printed on a single page with very small letters, hence the name one time pad. And instead of working on bits, as I told you, one can work on letters or characters and so on. But it is easier to uh, talk about this cipher in terms of bits. And but so it is unbreakable, but there are some problems. The key is too long because your key has to be as long as the, your uh, plain text. Another problem is key distribution, since you can use a single key only once. For every message beforehand, you have to give your keys to the person you want to communicate. And the third problem is all of your keys has to be generated in a random way. So as you can see, we so the cipher is secure and breakable but it is not that practical to be used in practice so let's move on to weaknesses as i told you you cannot use the same key twice an example for this so if the adversary captures two cipher takes c1 and c2 which were generating with generated with the same key then they can compute the following since they have c1 and c2 this is the xor operation by the way so if you xor c1 and c2 in reality, C1 is just plain text one XOR with the key, your runtime pad, and uh, your second C2 is your second plain text XOR with the key. So if you do this computation, actually it is equivalent to doing this three XOR operations. But since we are actually performing operations in modulo 2, since XOR is addition in modulo 2, when you do this addition, Ks cancel each other. So you end up with P1 XOR P2. So the attacker who captures the cipher text, uh, if they XOR them, they get the XOR of the plain text. At this point on, you can do many tricks uh, because now you uh, you don't know what is P1 or P2. You just know their XOR. But since uh, the language contains redundancy, adversary, adversary can use this redundancy and statistical techniques to capture some parts of p1 and p2 and sometimes can capture the whole p1 and p2 and uh, there are some historical examples for that for instance the venona project is the project of the united states so soviet one-time pad messages sent from the u.s for a brief time during world war ii used non-random key material u.s cryptanalysts beginning in the late 40s were able to entirely or partially break a few thousand messages out of several hundred thousand so this means that even if the cipher is unbreakable it can be broken when it is not used properly this is very important and this actually happens in real life too when we have modern ciphers which are secure are used in by in wrong modes of operations or are used in uh, with wrong parameters so they are broken in practice so you have to know the main idea behind the cipher so that you can use it in a proper way. We know that one-time pads are exchanged between Washington and Moscow in order to be used in the future if it, is, it becomes necessary. But uh, as I told you, this uh, idea of one-time pad, or also called Vernum cipher, is not practical to be used in practice, but the idea behind it actually leads us to the idea of stream ciphers. So today's stream ciphers are uh, the successor of this uh, cipher, and I think we will talk about stream ciphers a few weeks later. So these uh, ciphers so far we talk about were pen and paper methods, but uh, technological advancements replaced pen and met paper methods with machines. Be before computers, we had machines, and most famous example is Enigma. An Enigma machine is an electromechanical rotor cipher machine. It was used in 20th century in military and commercial commercial sectors like banking so people think that this is just a, a cipher machine used by Germans in the second world war uh, and it is uh, designed just for the war but actually it was used in banking before the war started so it generates a polyalphabetic substitution cipher uh, and we know that cryptanalysis of enigma by British mathematicians or cryptologists 
changed the course of the Second World War. During this script analysis, they had the initial help of Polish cryptologists because uh, there was actually some kind of an encoding problem. They didn't know how to uh, how the German letters are actually performed in these operations and so on. So a picture. Uh, that you can find on the internet is something like this. So this is the Enigma machine. It is like a uh, typewriter. You write your plain text by using this uh, typewriter, but depending on the positions of the rotors, when you press a letter, it prints something else on the paper. So and the positions of the rotor changes changes. So for example, if you press A, some other letter appears like C, and if you press A again something else appears and so on and so forth because the position of the rotor changes all the time and when you want to decrypt you type it again from the ciphertext and you obtain the plain text but the, here in this machine the key is actually the position of the rotors so when you want to communicate with somebody you have to be using the same position of the rotors uh, here there is a problem uh, a letter is never mapped to itself. So have, get an Enigma machine and press the letter A maybe a million times, but you will see that on the ciphertext there are, A never appears. This is some kind of a, actually a measure. Maybe they thought that uh, if the same letter appears as in the ciphertext, maybe some words can be guessed by the attacker. So this is maybe put there were put there as a precaution, but Actually, this uh, idea uh, led to the break of the Enigma machine. So the weakness is a letter is never encrypted to itself. So how we can use this information? Uh, so in the second world war, what they did was the get, capture the ciphertext, especially at the uh, border watchtower, so that uh, they get the ciphertext and they know that at some point probably they will be sending the message nothing to report and this is has a special uh, way of saying it in german keine besondere ereignisse so in turkish there is a direct translation for this which is asayish berkemal so this is something uh, that you don't use daily but used in the military uh, context so they try to match if any of the cipher texts um, can contain this message so what they do is they get the ciphertext and write this uh, expected message here and check if any plain text letter matches with the ciphertext letter. If this happens, this means that uh, this message is not sent here because we know that Enigma machine never maps the same letter to itself. So they uh, position it one letter further and check if it matches and so on and so forth. It, uh, the red ones means that this position are wrong, but maybe this is correct. So how we can know it? Uh, you have to get your positions of your rotor so that this cipher text will be decrypted to this message. Then continue decrypting the rest of your message and see if it means something meaningful in German. Then you get the crypt analysis. But uh, Germans constantly modified their machines during the war and their latest cipher machines eluded the allied cryptologists. So at the beginning of the war, Enigma is broken, but at the end, some of the machines were still not broken. This uh, cryptanalysis effort is actually led uh, a technological advancement, uh, which is called the Colossus computer. This is known as the first programmable electronic, electronic digital computer invented in 1943. It was developed by British codebreakers at Bletchley Park to cryptanalyze Lorentz cipher. Alan Turing's use of probability in cryptanalysis contributed to its design. This machine optically reads a paper tape and then applies programmable logical functions to the bits of the key and ciphertext characters, counting how often the function returned false. So uh, this is like a technological advancement and when the war was over, uh, British thought that they don't want to leak the information about this computer. So they destroyed the, this computer 
and actually they this is actually a very huge computer like a, it fits to in a very big room so they destroyed it to a very small pieces but uh, it was reconstructed in 2007 and currently it is available in Belashti Park in a museum but I'm hoping that this pandemic ends sometime soon and you can visit this museum and see the machine with your own eyes so there is actually a lot of things to say about uh, history of cryptography there are very good books about this the code Codebreakers is one of the famous by David Kahn. Also, Simon Singh has a book uh, related to this, or you can also uh, have some puzzles and you know visit this website and uh, work on these historical ciphers if you want. But uh, again, we can talk on this topic for a very long time. But these are enough for us to move on to uh, modern cryptography.